uh, which is a good transition to talk about the difference between your first session in terms of the makeup of the delegation and the second. I came with more experience in the second session, but certainly leaps and bounds uh, with regard to the delegation. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that the individual delegation members didn't remain committed. Senator Shapley did excellent work with regard to Medicaid reimbursement rates and, and, and addressing inequities on the border. Um, but overall, um, there, like I said, there was a spotlight on us. I mean, we have a freshman senator. We have four, uh, no, I'm sorry, three members under four years um, in the House delegation. So it was a great opportunity and a challenge to make sure that we didn't fit into that mold again of this infighting, of this disruptive behavior of, you know, it almost would seem like in, in my first session, they just kind of said, well, that's El Paso. You know, mm -hmm. that they, they kind of take care, of, they take care of themselves. Meaning they probably fight it out within themselves and whether or not it even gets to the floor or even gets to a vote is on them. Um, this next session, we were all very committed to one another's legislation. Uh, hey, I need your help on this. I need to make sure that people, can you talk to us? You saw that dynamic really flourish in this last, this last session. Did we vote and agree on every single issue? No, but the fact that we could communicate with one another, Jaime, was something that was unbelievable. And not only for us, for me, coming in that worked in both sessions, but for other colleagues to see that. The speaker even spoke to that when he was here. He met with the editorial board. And I don't remember if you remember that, that, that interview where he says, I am so surprised at the delegation. I'm so you know, excited that they're getting together. And, and then I think somebody asked him, well, what does that mean? What are you saying about the past, the past legislation? He says, that was not the case, but it is now. Mm -hmm. So that, that's huge that the leadership is seeing that we're, we're coming together. Uh, given the, the dynamic of the House and the horse trading that's involved with passing any piece of legislation, even the most mundane, seems to require you know, working with uh, folks from both sides of the aisle and, and doing a, a fair amount of negotiating, is it important, and if it is, to what extent is it, to have an all-democratic delegation in, uh, in Austin representing El Paso? Well, certainly I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it Part, solely on partisan. The fact that Representative Marco was on appropriations was huge, but it could have been the same with Representative Pickett if he had been on appropriations. The point is with the, that we need pe individuals in the, on those important committees to communicate with us. And and that's just a part of, I, I you know, if Representative, uh, uh, former Representative Moody had been on that appropriations, the same would have been expected. Um, there to be some solid communication between the delegation um, so I don't really see it as a partisan issue because one of our senior members, Democratic, could have been on those important committees, could have certainly fostered the communication that we had through our delegation. Certainly, and, and, and I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm, I'm sort of having you speak about your colleagues, but I, I understand that the dynamic of El Paso is we, when we're in session in Austin, we're sort of looked at as one animal, much like you know a lot of the other larger cities, their delegations are looked in the same way. Uh, and in this last session, there were some really important uh, votes taken, particularly on the budget and education, where everyone in the delegation, with the, with the exception of one member, voted a particular way. That member voted a different way. So that's where that question comes from. And that, and that vote, look, I mean, let's, let's put it in its context. Let's talk about our delegation within the bigger picture. And, okay. you know, 101 votes, they didn't need us to show up to, right. to conduct business. Um, and to say that the one member of our delegation made or broke, I mean, made or could make or break um, a particular issue like the budget is unfair because they pretty much were hitting us 99 to 49 every single, every single time. Mm -hmm. Now, to see that dynamic in the 81st would have been something different because you had a split house. And so, you know, you would have had to have seen members of either party move over on certain issues and it would have been interesting to see how the budget would have come out. So that particular political dynamic comes into play more when the numbers are closer? Is that essentially it? I would think so. Okay. Um, back to your... And, and but I certainly guess we weren't in the same case right, with certainly. regards to the, the deficit that we were in this past session. Yeah. Right. Uh, going back to your, your first session, you have one 
particular bill that a uh, vote on a bill that that gained a certain level of criti criticism, and that was on the energy bill, mm -hmm. um, in which the vote you cast essentially sided with corporations, and the critics will say over workers. Do you want to clarify that position and that vote? Yes, the bill itself, and the reason why I voted for it was that you have many small businesses here on the border um, that do comply with state and federal laws. That means they carry workman's comp, they carry liability insurance, um, they do everything right, particularly small businesses. Um, and that, was, that, that vote was to continue to protect people that do the right thing, that make sure that their workers have certain safeguards. And to say that that doesn't mean anything overall, that was my reasoning particularly for voting for the energy vote. And I know that there's been a significant amount of criticisms about what this means down the line, but at that moment, I made an informed decision and, and took into account the small businesses that we have here in El Paso, the great amount of development that we have with UTEP and Fort Bliss, um, the, particularly contractors. So for example, uh, you have contractors that are coming in here and hiring workers. Well, I want to make sure that the incentive is there for them to continue having workman's comp and, and providing those benefits should something happen to a worker and not necessarily uh, making the worker who is injured or was injured um, have to go through a whole different system that may take 18 to 24 months. Um, and I want, the, the, the bottom line is there was an incentive for small businesses to continue doing the right thing and holding all themselves accountable with regard to workman's comp and also liability insurance. So moving on into the last session, uh, previously at the Westside Democrats uh, endorsement uh, event, you spoke uh, in your remarks about how women were under assault in that last session. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I'm so glad you asked this, because <laughs> this is a very important uh, theme for me. And I was at the Medical Society last night, and they said, well, what were some of the major issues instances? This is very dangerous ground. The sonogram bill was extremely dangerous legislation. Why? It is now infringing on a doctor-patient relationship. When we are legislating at the state level, what happens between you and your doctor, it's unacceptable. Because where's the line? What are we going to start saying now that certain insurances don't have to cover certain illnesses or those types of things? I'm not saying that this is a direct correlation to this, but it, it's a line. Now, we've already established what the, the law is, the Fet Roe versus Wade, is that a woman has the choice to make. Now, if she chooses to so terminate a pregnancy, she has the right to do that, okay? We at the state level, what the sonogram bill really meant was that the doctor would have to, to, to put the patient through a very invasive, intrusive procedure against the patient's will. That's huge. That's huge for me as a woman. Um, that's huge for my, my female counterparts and my community members. They shouldn't have to be subjected to unnecessary procedures if they don't choose so. That's between the doctor to, to, uh, to communicate with the patient about, hey, these are the risks. That comes with any procedure, Jaime. There's no need for them to put them through a procedure as intrusive as a transvaginal sonogram. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's not something we should be addressing at the state level when we have a $27 billion deficit. So I am certainly, um, I was, it, it really did upset me that that type of legislation is still coming down in 2012, 2011. Uh, we certainly took a stand against it. Representative Gonzalez and I uh, filed an amendment that made it very clear that nobody, nobody, man, female, children, don't want to be told what to do with their bodies, that it has to be an individual choice. What were some of the other um, issues that dealt with women in that last session? Well, certainly there was all sorts of legislation filed having to do with that looked like the sonogram, that, you know, did other things. The other thing was family planning, cutting family planning, cutting monies to family planning. There was debate on the floor about whether or not the morning after pill induces an abortion. I mean, really? We're still talking about these issues? We're giving women more options, and yet we're still trying to have the same argument. And it's just... It, also access, access to health care, access to health care for women. That was, ex that was under attack 
in every corner when we talked about the budget. Because it came back to that Tea Party rhetoric of, oh, this is about abortion. No, it's about access to health care. Women have different needs. Women um, in childbearing age have different needs. They need access to their annuals. They need access to mammograms. They need access to contraceptives if they so choose. And for us to take that away, for even access to it, not saying that they are using it or, or there aren't, but to take away that, that relationship they have with their doctors and to cut funding with regard to those issues was absolutely an assault and an attack on women. And correct me if I'm wrong, is that not also more of an impact on uh, on women on the lower end of the economic scale? Does that impact them more? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you hear a lot of conversations with Planned Parenthood. Uh, recently, uh, Susan G. Komen uh, decided to remove or to, you know cut funding to Planned Parenthood. You saw that outreach because a lot of the women that don't have insurance depend largely on Planned Parenthood for their health care needs and for basic health care needs. Right, which would We're not talking procedures. We're talking just regular exams, annual exams. Um, you know, mammograms, just any kind of health screenings. Uh, we're not certainly talking about extensive procedures at this point, just access to mm -hmm. a primary care physician.